This episode of Co-op is brought to you by the new voice-activated sync featuring hands-free calling, music search, and turn-by-turn navigation, Air Force H2, and Squarespace. We have so much going on next week. We have the narratives, Monday, Tuesday, we're gonna be shooting. Right. We're gonna have to do like three chats back to back. Wow. And uh, yeah. oh, oh, what, what, what? We're gonna go see Mass Effect 2 today. Oh shit, I forgot really? about it. Wait, that is no. a little baby no. thing. No, did you not hear me earlier when I said the app store has a billion more apps than the fucking droids? Oh yeah, store? apps that can be used one at a time. What? Multitasking, bitch, in your waist. Cares. You know what, no and I can get it. service, I can take calls. No. No yeah, one you know what? This cares. works like a phone and like a, this is a computer. I am touring right like now. Oh, I love these meetings. You know, there's a lot of games coming out this holiday season, like yeah. every season. Which is kind of unfortunate for certain games, like Little Big Planet PSP, because it's totally overlooked. It, I haven't it, heard anyone talking about it at no, all. No, which is weird because it's so good. I played a whole lot of Little Big Planet in, in the beta period, but I never actually played the full retail oh, game. Oh, you didn't? So this is like my first real Little Big Planet experience, and I feel like I'm not really missing out on all that much. The soundtrack is the thing that jumps out to me first, mm. just because it's so goddamn amazing. It sounds like the soundtrack from the first one without being the same songs, yeah. and without even being the same artist, so it has that same sort of quality when you're going through it, you're like, man, I've never played a game that sounds like this. The whole game is extremely playful, and when you go to different locations, you start in Down Under, and everything was representative in art style and music style of the location in the world of where the levels were supposed to be taking place. Right. And everything had its own kind of whimsical but reverent atmosphere to it. Right, and that part, you know, part of that is the music, and part of that is like the characters that they, you know, create out of different world elements yeah. that uh, tell you the story as you go through the game. And that's one of the places where I feel like, um, I think this was done by Studio Cambridge, where the, the developer of the PSP version doesn't quite live up to Media Molecule, so I feel like some of the 2D art and the characters that kind of tell the story along the way, mm. I just don't like the art direction as much on the characters. And it's just a little tiny thing, it really doesn't matter that much, but that just to sh uh, goes to show how much they nailed in, in the PSP version. <laughs> First thing I did when I got Little Big Planet for PS3 was play through the single player game. And I thought it would just be kind of okay, um, and that the main draw would have been like creating levels and downloading other people's stages, mm -hmm. which was really fun. But I have to say that no, my favorite part of the game was playing through the campaign. They clearly know their tools really, really well. I mean, at least as good as the best people that are making stages out there. Yep. And so there's just so much heart put into each of the levels. Si No 
I think the thing that was most surprising to me was the fact that the entire single player portion of the of the game is all new stages. Mm. They feel like the first game, same level of quality, different developer. But if you really enjoyed that campaign from the PS3 version, it's here in the PSP version, totally new. It's almost like a sequel yeah. in that respect. And I love like the little, there's little extra stages too. Like when you find the key in a stage, mm -hmm. and it'll unlock these little like bonus, bonus score stages. Packs yeah, yeah. stages. Mm -hmm. And those are always some really cool, just uh, almost a different play style where you know there'll be score attack or right. a race or something like that. My issue with Little Big Planet, and you can tell me if this is similar to the PS3 version, is that I find the platforming often to be really frustrating. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what it is. If you miss jumps in the old version, you're going to miss them here. If you hated the platforming in the PS3 version, you're not going to like it in this. It's mm. exactly the same. You know, you still only have the ability to do like the these kind of weirdly marked jumps that you know, you do have control how long you press the button does affect the height, but not in the ways you want. And sometimes if you're standing on an object that, like that has, that's on an angle, you don't it jump off it the right way. Jump off it, yeah. you, you can grab things, but you can't it pull. Falls. Yeah, so like it doesn't matter. If you're hanging onto a ceiling, you're just gonna have to drop down anyway. Yeah. So when you're playing the, the PS3 version, you really feel like a puppeteer mm -hmm. because uh, you hold down the L and R triggers and depending upon what you're holding yeah, at any given time, that. you can like move your arms around and do all this stuff. You can also, of course, using the D-pad, change your expression and that sort of thing yeah. yeah it was it was a platforming game and I was just playing through it as a game but sometimes you're like the actor as well and you're mm -hmm. trying to like put on the best performance you can and even uh, if that performance is just for yourself exactly <laughs> And the PSP version has the expression changes, but it doesn't, it doesn't have, have the puppeteering sort of arm movement thing. Yeah. All it, you have is like hold L trigger, and then if you press one of the directional pads, then you can do like some special moves, like little dance moves. They're actually pretty deep. For each different expression that you put on, it's a whole different set of gestures that you can do on the D-pad right. from it. Yeah. Even though it's not quite as interactive as it was in the, in the PS3 game, um, I still feel like it's a good alternative and something that I'd even like to see brought into the PS3 version yeah, later. Yeah. You can customize your character in this game. You could do that in the PS3 version as well. And I did it a lot. I really yeah. would change up my outfit oh, based on the stage. I doing it a lot too. I didn't do it as much in the PSP version and it's for little technical reasons. When in the PS3 game, when you start to uh, mod your character, mm -hmm. the camera pans in, gets real close I to the screen. I didn't understand why it didn't do that, why there was no option for that. Because they also, in each of the individual areas that you go to that are themed, there's a themed costume for both a uh, uh, a, a boy and a girl. They're, they're really cool, and it's cool to be a themed character running through these themed stages, but exactly. I was like, I would really like to see this up close and personal. Right, so I just didn't use that element of the game anywhere near as much as I did in the PS3 version, mm -hmm. which was like all the time. The only major feature that gets axed to the PSP version that was in the PS3 version is that there's no multiplayer. If you played through P the PS3 version in co-op, mm -hmm. you probably had a great time doing yeah, it. Yeah. And so, yeah, that would feel like a, a big feature to, to lose. For me, it's not that big a deal because I played through it solo and I really enjoyed it that way. And it has the parts of the game that I really wanted, which was the level creation and, more importantly, the ability to download levels that other people have made. I'm not the type of guy who has that much time to make the stages, but I love playing through other people's stuff. Definitely, especially and, when they're high quality. Exactly. Yeah. And so far, I've gotten to play, like, you know, Sonic the Hedgehog levels, <laughs> random pinball stages that I've downloaded. Um, and, and, you know, there isn't quite the same... Um, amount of stages up on the, as the PS3 version right now, sure. even not like what it was like when the PS3 version first launched. And mm -hmm. I think it's just, like we said, I haven't heard people talking about this game. I don't know well, what I'm sure is. it has, you know, and there aren't as, I'm sure not as many people have bought this game as have bought the PS3 version. True. Yet. It's really impressive, and I think that, you know, if more people buy the PSP version, it's just going to benefit everyone else, because then we'll get more of the stages to yep. play later. Yep. And so, yeah, if you forgot that Little Big Planet was coming out this year uh, on PSP, <laughs> or if you like the PS3 version, yeah. man, get this PSP version. It's, it's basically the same sort of thing, but yeah. with a bunch or, of new content. Or if you only have a PSP and don't have a PS3 and always wanted to play it, now's your chance. Exactly. This episode of Co-op is sponsored by the new voice-activated sync. It gives you hands-free voice command of your mobile phones and media players, so when you're in a car, you can focus on where you're going. It's available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury vehicles. So what Sync Technology does is listens to your voice and allows you to make calls on your mobile phone, search and listen to music and podcasts on your MP3 player, get turn-by-turn -turn navigation and real-time traffic and weather, all while keeping your eyes on the road. Sync also includes a 911 assist that automatically calls 911 if you're in an accident, a 411 business search that includes over 14 million U.S. business listings and provides turn-by-turn -turn directions to any of them, and even personalized traffic reports. 
Sync knows your routes and gives you traffic reports. It even reroutes you with turn-by-turn -turn directions if you need it. To learn more about the voice-activated Sync, visit SyncMyBridePodcast.com. No, 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 you no. just, you just don't point, know when to take a hint. No. That's the all. The main point is that your phone has no apps. Mine does. What do you call 20,000 apps it's on an app store? App store. Whatever. App store. Hey, I have 20,000 on my phone. Lucky. You know what? Lucky. You might want to check your email. You might have something. Oh. I don't know. Maybe, maybe a photo got sent to you. I, <laughs> I wouldn't know anything about that, though. Oh, oh. Well, that that's just, oh. Real mature. Yeah. Come on. The, yeah. Yeah. Suck yeah. on that. Yeah, Guys. Suck mature. on that. Are we still real doing nice. your phones? We have an interview to do. We're here I to play know, Mass Effect. No, Adults just, are talking here, Jay. You know, I mean, come on. I'm yeah. getting mad. Yeah. I'm getting mad. We'll see what he says. Oh, yeah. So. Oh! Yeah. In your face. Your lead technical artist? I'm actually a producer on Mass Effect 2. Oh, you are? Yeah. Uh, well, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got a raise. <laughs> actually, no, it's a kind of promotion. Um, I was the lead technical artist on the first game. Oh, okay. And I just kind of, you know, evolved into a producer role. And oh, I still actually cool. work with artists. Right. And it's, uh, you know, I, I enjoy that. I think. Um, I come from an artistic background. Yeah. I can uh, work with them a bit more. I can I can know if they're kind of pulling my leg, <laughs> right? Yeah. They're lying to you about how long it takes to get something done. Oh, I didn't yeah. want to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I work with them well, right? Exactly. And I really like uh, you know, I, and you know, in that sense, I actually like working with artists. Uh, more of a natural affinity because I think I can understand you know the concerns that they have. As a technical artist, what does that mean exactly for your role? Because I know that that can involve sort of a lot of different aspects of what's being put into the game. Our artists are really great, um, but sometimes they make art that's actually too great, too fantastic. Right. <laughs> that, uh, Can't so. fit it in the box. <laughs> yeah, I, I need, you know, three Xbox 360s. <laughs> so, as a technical artist, you kind of work with them to basically um, make sure the art looks great, uh, but also that if it works within memory, um, that doesn't crash the system. Right. But, yeah, that's not too amazing. I was a pretty big fan of Mass Effect 1. I was not. Yeah? I actively disliked it. Like, like just, did you beat it? Did you make it I through the I finished it, yeah. yes, and uh, I played as the squishy gets killed a lot class, <laughs> yeah. and it was a frustration almost from start to finish for me. Yeah, I felt like you really had to go like a vanguard or soldier class or some, something combat oriented to really be successful as yeah. far as not getting frustrated, or you would. You would die a lot in the game, and it felt like there was more potential there than there was actual game to really be in love with. They're my, I, kind of the same way I felt about Assassin's Creed, where I was like, man, right. I really love the direction they're heading with this. I like the world they're presenting and the characters and the story, but it just, they didn't feel like they'd worked out all the kinks yet, that they needed another iteration to sort of get it right. Between the, uh, the, the driving stuff that was all wonky, yeah. and it felt like it really wasn't balanced for all the classes, and the combat itself, Overall, I didn't find to be particularly fun. I had a lot of genuine criticisms with the first one. I had to go through and do every single one of those extra level, you know, those, those missions where you could go off and explore the planets and everything, and they're just so boring. I was just yeah. driving around in that buggy and just bumping around on the, the, the floaty thing, and it just it, it didn't do it for me, and so I, I really hope that they, they fix that. When we started Mass Effect 2, we knew the areas that we, we could improve upon. Um, but we also took every last fe bit of feedback from our fans and the press, mm -hmm. literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we put it into this huge list. And we combined it with um, what we wanted to fix. And that became the blueprint. And you know, Uncharted Worlds uh, came up near the top. Yeah. Mm. It was an area that we felt we could do much better in. The whole idea of those planets was to give this sense of exploration to the, to the player yeah. so that they get a wider sense of this incredible you know, galaxy that's you know, different vegetation, right. different mm -hmm. terrain. Mm -hmm. And I think players are in for a real treat because uh, we finally actually delivered. And sometimes you're going to be in there for, uh, you know, for a quick extraction. Sometimes you're going to be like you know, really long battles. But the idea is that uh, you'll never land on the same planet twice. Cool. And everything very will look cool. very unique.
The frame rate has drastically improved over Mass Effect 1, even though the visuals are also drastically improved. So I'm wondering how far away are you from the original, you know, Unreal engine that you guys started with? Is it something completely different by now? Is that what you had to do to make it more efficient? We've, we've modified quite a lot uh, from you know, the base, what we call the base vanilla Epic Unreal. And we were actually the first, one of the first Unreal like uh, developers to sign on to that technology. So now it's almost been about six years and we really kind of, uh, I'd like to say we we're really familiar with you know, how the engine works. And the artists have done just a phenomenal job. Um, I think they don't get enough credit sometimes, but they've found some really kind of smart creative and efficient ways and this is the technical artist inside right yeah sure that loves it is that they still have this fantastic eye but at the same time they can get a lot more bang for your buck yeah and sometimes we forget what an amazing game it looks like so we go back and play <laughs> Mass Effect 1 and say boy we've come a, a long That's way true. check anyone on this frequency anybody still alive out there hello Wilson. It looks so good. Oh. It makes me go, why does Dragon Age not look as good as this? Come on. I know. And it really does look like a darker tone that they keep talking about. It looks more like the action movie yeah. sequel than the first one. I had a lot of friends that quit Mass Effect 1 very early because it just it's a very slow burn. We were talking about I, that uh, before, the Citadel. And yeah. you get into yeah. the Citadel, Citadel and it just me. opens up yeah. and there's just so many different directions that you can go into that a lot of people, I had friends too, that just stopped playing then because there's just too many options and I feel at least for the part that we played it was it was fairly controlled I mean you could still go around and explore but for the most part yeah. you, you, you were you were kind of guided from A to B. Yeah, there's I, a lot of tutorial stuff but yeah. I felt like it was moving at a very good pace and there's a lot of new things they need to teach you in this game now yeah. it feels a lot different to play it than the first one did. It's like Gears of War now with yes. the role-playing game around yeah. it. Yeah yeah totally. Yeah. It's a full-on shooter yeah. right? Yeah. And the cover mechanic, I can't remember that was in the first game. It was, but you had to sort of, it was it was like a snap that you had yeah. when you were up against the wall. And I never, I, in the first game I didn't use cover a lot, but this feels a lot more like Gears. Oh, it's that same, you can run toward it and then slide yeah. into it like Gears. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like yeah. that a lot. The skills are mapped very well now. I like how the right tr the right bumper um, allows you to tapping it allows you to immediately uh, use an assigned skill like that overload, which was a skill from the first game. And then um, I played the engineer class, and what was assigned to my Y button was this great uh, little omni sort of tool that I could shoot out at an enemy and it would distract them. I already felt like that gave me more options to be creative than it did where it felt just more of a straightforward run and gun shooter when I was playing the first one. I also think the way that the enemies reacted to your being shot made it feel more like a shooter, being shooting off limbs and... Get headshots. Yeah. And it was giving you a little kind of Gears of War sort of progression and like when I got my first headshot it was like one of 30 headshots. And right. If you get 30 right. you get some sort of upgrade or something. I, I think that's... And you could shoot off the legs of a robot and it would still try to crawl yeah. towards yeah. you. It's very satisfying. Yeah. You know, it feels like the world is really living and breathing when that kind of stuff yeah. happens. We tweak the facial animations, we tweak the, the skin shaders, we tweak the eyes, uh, we, tweak, we tweak all the details on Shepard armor yeah. and you'll see like this crazy amount of carbon fiber detail. Yeah. Everything that the player does, we actually want to reward them visually with something. You know, and gameplay wise. So when you blow off, you know, uh, an enemy's head, we want to have this fantastic experience. It's like, oh that was really cool. But when you activate your power, we want to have a really visual cool feedback so that people say, yeah, I enjoyed you know casting up that, that spell. And you know, same thing when you're firing the weapon, mm -hmm. like all those things, so that there's got to be some great visual feedback. The two new characters that you got introduced with, and they're sort of part of your squad. I really liked both of them a lot. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. And I really enjoyed the conversations. I actually was putting a lot of thought into those the dialogue trees and sort of the choices you were having. And I felt like you really have a little bit more room to sort of develop the kind of personality that you want. There's some new uh, like interrupt right. uh, yeah. feature like in the middle of dialogue where you, you get this kind of, it's almost like a quick time event where something pops up on screen or you can change the course of the discussion as long as you hit the button at the right time. Yeah, it was the thing they talked about having in the first game that yeah. they weren't able to implement. Wait, Shepard? I'm not taking any chances with it's such a huge feat for a developer and artist to not only build a universe, but you guys are building one from scratch. The aliens, the, the story, everything is, is of your own IP. And I mean, how do you manage the amount of artists and the amount of content that is being created and deciding where does it go? Like, how do you logistically handle that? I, I think instead of a constraint question, it's more like, what a wonderful opportunity. Imagine you had free reign 
to develop this entire universe. Yeah. And you weren't bound by existing IP of you know what would work, how would things would work. And so one of the great things about working on on the Mass Effect R team is that we take input from everyone as long as it's a good idea. That's, that's actually what carries through. And so I think you know, uh, you know coming from an art school background. That's the best type of constraint, mm -hmm. where there's, it, yeah. where it's like, hey, you know what? We trust you, um, that you understand, you know, what our game's about, um, you know, what the environment's all about. But go free. We want you to, because you probably know that subject matter better than anyone mm -hmm. else. And so there's a lot of freedom to the artist to, to make their own interpretations of the Mass Effect universe. Mm -hmm. And our art director does a really good job of kind of reining them in, just making sure that you know the the, the major themes are carried through, yeah. uh, which is a very important job as well. Yeah. But at the same time, every artist feels that they can they can, they have their input, and that's really important. Instead of just being told to do something, they can contribute and create in this process of creation. And how big is your art team? The entire team for the project was about 60 people, yeah. and since at the end of the project we've kind of doubled to about 120. And of that, I'm trying to remember, our, our team's maybe about 30 to 45, and, that's, wow. uh, and that includes the animation team as okay. well. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very elite group of artists. Um, very prolific, apparently. Yeah. With a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the great thing is each guy um, can do an amazing amount of work, and we demand a lot from our artists, uh, but at the same time, I think uh, they produce world-class top art, and so it's, it's, a, it's a mutual trust relationship and we developed a really strong art team and I'm really glad you guys actually talk about this because it's not something that really comes to the forefront usually when right. we talk about games. We're well within our rights to investigate attacks on a human colony. I'd like to know what the Quarians are doing here. I feel like especially this year in the last six months sequels have been really great. You look at Uncharted 2, Assassin's Creed 2 where they've just been these great iterations on this like foundation that their predecessors started and this really just is shaping up to be the exact same thing. Ray was claiming that this is the best game Bioware has ever made. Yeah, he said that a number of times, didn't yeah. he? That's ballsy. Yeah. And, and when you think of the pedigree of Bioware, I mean, that's a bold statement. Yeah. That yeah. really is. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, I, I was so wait. won over by Dragon Age, even though I, I was certain I wasn't going to like it. Mm -hmm. And I was so won over by that game that I, I'm ready for this one to really knock my socks off. Yeah. And it, it looks solid. I guess it's, it's not a secret that you get to choose whether to, to be a Navi or a human. And right. I completed both quests, I guess, of the game. I did RDA and he did Navi. At the beginning of the game, before you've chosen, you basically do a mission that's like an RDA mission and they put you in in, in your avatar. So you get a, a small taste of both of the gameplay experiences early on. And a lot of people, when they saw the game at first, they thought, man, this looks a lot like Lost Planet. And um, the shooting just didn't feel as good as like a game like Lost Planet to me, even in the little bit that I played to begin with. So I, when I, at least when I was playing as the Navi, it felt like something different than that. And so I just decided to go that route. That was a totally different experience as well, because it ended up feeling more like a like open world MMO RPG sort of game um, than I was expecting at all. It didn't really feel like a shooter to me. Uh, and it's little things like when you fire your bow as the Navi, um, <laughs> before the arrow has, like right when the arrow leaves your bow, the enemy dies and a little experience yeah. 50 points comes up and like the arrow like gets there two seconds later, you know? You know, it's definitely trying to be like an MMO, it's trying to present this, this huge open world, but I did not get that feeling like no. once at all. You you go into this one world and it's like you have the, your your quest givers. You go to this one guy. Mm -hmm. He says go across the map, find this thing. Go to the other guy, and then you you finish all of those quests. That's all there is to do there, basically. And then you not, go to the next. Not map. only that, there's no side quests. It's Nothing. it's it's a totally linear game that's posing as something else, and that's that's I guess what I meant. Like, I, I'm not saying that it was like an MMO. I think it was trying to feel like that and trying to pose as a shooter at the same time, and it's. It doesn't quite equal up on either of those those levels at all. In fact, the thing that 
is best about the game to me is the just the environment is a really nice world to run around in that was what was pushing me forward because the characterization the story and the action itself was just not enough you, you played through as the Navi, and, yeah. and I agree that the worlds looked like very different. Each each level looked very distinct as a Navi, but right. as a human, it was just jungle the entire time. It was so boring. Like, yeah, did you yeah. get that? Well, I did run across a few environments that I thought were amazing. You know, when when you first get into the I can't remember the name of the stages because they all have different yeah, names, but no. but they're, they're the the flying stage where you are as the human, where you finally get to jump into you know the aliens dropship basically. Only it has rotor blades instead of jet engines to get around. There was an area that I just went into that had it, it was it was almost like everything was lit by black lights and it was very pretty and pink and purple and stuff inside yeah, but on the other hand it feels like all I can really see around me is big leafy plants yeah when I was uh, going from world to world as the, the Nobby you know you'd be in like a standard jungle stage and then you know there's this whole quest very early on where you're you're uh, getting to find you have to climb up to the Ekron which are like these flying dragon looking things that you've seen in all the movie trailers mm -hmm. and once you get a hold of that, it's like, oh, cool, now I can fly around this space. I guess I'm going to spend the rest of the game flying it. I felt like what I imagined it must feel like in World of Warcraft to get a mount for the first time and be able yeah, to like except that, fly around it. Except that if the Navi is anything like the human ones, I had the one stage where I got to fly a lot, and then I never got to fly again. Exactly. So it, they, But at least at least it was a different stage. It was that experience, or that, that what I felt that first time I saw it was what made me want to keep playing the game and makes me excited to go see the movie eventually and makes me wish that I was playing the game in 3D, which I'm sure that no one is doing. Yeah. This game still has terrible animation, um, you know, like two frames of animation. You, you can't, if you're jumping, uh if you jump and then try to grab a vine, that like doesn't work at all. You have to mm -hmm. like st walk up to the vine, be right in the right spot, hit the button, and then you snap to it and do your two frames of animation. I mean, it's all yeah, really super choppy. The Navi was just yeah. that was so silly. Like, <laughs> like you know, the, the Navi are supposed to be this agile race of creatures, but the only thing and yes, they run fast. You know, you have a the L trigger, you can do a dodge, but the dodge is the same every single time. You know. I guess maybe there are games like Assassin's Creed and Uncharted that are spoiling us, um, but you know, it's hard to go back to playing a game like that and get invested in your characters, especially when the voice acting is also totally right. a joke. Well, and there, and there is no investment in any of the characters in the game because you, as the main character, you're kind of a dick. You don't have any decent lines, and then I anybody and in, anybody that you're running into in the game, they're all dicks to you, and none of them have really well read lines. So yeah. you're like, it is. If, you're, if you don't enjoy the, the shooting gallery aspect of this game, you're not going to enjoy it at all. But I also feel like it's the type of thing, there's enough sort of seeds planted in this, at least in the way the world's built, that uh, if you... The, the next Avatar game, if there is another one, could really be something that it actually has some good game gameplay in there as well. And it's right. not that gameplay here is bad, it's just across the board mediocre. Yeah, yeah. it's not a, a bad game. It's no, just like all. in every way average. It's yeah. like it's not going to be in any way offensive to anybody. Nope. And yeah. It's just no, oh, I'm going through the the motions. Go yep. to this point, hit Y, go to the next part. But I, I was not invested in the, the story whatsoever. Oh, I got no. I got to the very end and that finally unlocked the, your whole Pandorapedia, which you know explains all of the yeah. game. And I was like, you know, maybe at some point it's gonna explain kind of what's going on, but I didn't feel like the game ever lets you know what's going on. No. You have to read through these this tome of, of knowledge that is this Pandorapedia. And it's so science fiction bullshit, boring. <laughs> you're, you're trying to find unobtainium? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Like, I, I know that that's a, a science fiction term, but it, it's still silly. Yeah. It's like, I, and it, we're in an atmosphere of can't breathe -ium, and we have bullets made of really, really hardium. <laughs> well, the variety of What's powers there? and the variety of powers I thought was cool. You know, like the, the, um, you know, as the humans, you have the airstrike, and you have, you know, your cloaking ability, and right. you have speed and health. I, there's just lots of cool abilities to play around with that actually make the... Co I mean, if the combat was just the guns, then I, I would have thrown this game away a See, long and time as, ago. See, and as the Navi, you kind of need those abilities because a lot of times, yeah, you have to go cloaked every once in a while and s scurry by without anyone noticing or else you're just going to get fucked up. Well, one thing that I thought was kind of surprisingly fun was, you know, when you go to the, the map area, you're able to do the conquest oh, mode. Oh, I did see that, yeah. And, 
that was just kind of, it, it was super simple. It, it's, you have a risk type hex grid set right. up on the yeah. map and it's it's all about might makes right. As long as you have enough money to build troops and attack the other guys, you you win that board. And, and I thought that was kind of fun and addictive. Yeah. Like you said, experience doesn't matter anything and you, you can unlock more hit points and more critical chance shots in this, but and none of that mattered. I actually didn't play through it until I got to the very end of the game. And I was like, oh, this is kind of fun and addictive. You know, I did get a chance to see him play the game in 3D and really I feel that if you're able to play this game in 3D it almost makes up for all of the rest I, of the game. That's what I was going to say it's like if it was in 3D I feel like I wouldn't even care about the other stuff yeah. that would be totally and I mean it's, I was it's thinking like if you're a fan of Avatar that really likes the movie you should probably be getting this game and if you're the one of the five people on earth that has the 3D hardware necessary to play this game in 3D then there's no way you're not going to have the game because there's not even that much content to view in 3D right now. 3D is such a new tech and it's such a, 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 a great thing for a graphics for like myself yeah. to absorb that just the shooting gallery would be enough for me because the 3D would be everything else. But when you're just playing this game in 2D, all it is is kind of lost amongst the shuffle of really great games of this season. Yeah, I, I would be hard to recommend for someone who wasn't a super fan of Avatar. What if life was like Squarespace? Squarespace is a publishing system for anyone looking to build a blog, portfolio, or any kind of website. Squarespace offers a uniquely flexible tool for just about anyone, no coding experience required, to build high-end, complex websites with the same functionality and uniqueness that you find on some of the highest traffic pages on the web. Good taste not included. Sign up today and use promo code COOP. Turn right at Harrison Street, then turn right at 23rd Street. In 800 feet, turn right at Treat Avenue. Turn right at 23rd Street, then you will arrive at your destination. Yes, I will. Turn directions. <laughs> Droid does, bitch. <laughs> oh, yeah. Might want to move your car. <laughs> oh, my car. Oh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>